Mike Sanford was South Carolina's 115th governor. The Republican also served in Congress during two different terms, and in 2019, he ran for the Republican nomination for President of the United States. You might remember he was also censured by the South Carolina General Assembly related to an extramarital affair in 2009. In this afterwards interview, he talks with fellow former Republican Representative Charlie Dent from Pennsylvania about the future of the Republican Party and his book, Two Roads Diverged, A Second Chance for the Republican Party, the Conservative Movement, the Nation, and Ourselves. And this is a group who, you know, the Freedom Caucus, of which I was a part, uh, you know, initially was a, very much opposed to Trump, but then they completely, with the exception of Justin Amash, who's now left Congress as well, uh, completely flipped and became absolutely subservient to him. And that's not a little bit of a rotation on an issue based on new information or based on, you know, input from voters. It is just raw, crass pandering. More in a moment. South Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing, too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. Come celebrate 10 years in the ultimate open world of Tamriel and play The Elder Scrolls Online for free, now until April 9th. Adventure solo or alongside friends on unforgettable quests, slaying dragons, defending castles, and traversing wintry Skyrim or the mushroom forests of Morrowind. With no catch-up grind or subscription required and fun content no matter how long you have to play, start your legend today for free. Head to elderscrollsonline.com slash freeplay, rated M for Mature. It's great to be with my good friend, uh, former governor, former congressman, uh, Mark Sanford. And we're here this morning uh, to discuss uh, his his book, uh, Two Roads Diverged. And uh, I'm really excited to talk about this because this book really talks, I know, quite a bit about uh, second chances. And uh, and I noticed that uh, Governor Sanford, Congressman Sanford, was a, a great admirer of, of the, the author Robert Frost, uh, who's... Uh, Who's a uh, classic? Uh, one of his classic lines, of course, was uh, two roads diverged in a wood, and I, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. And that's what this book seems to be about. You know, your personal journey, your story, your highs and your lows. And I've always been so impressed by your ability uh, to discuss, you know, your lows. And you can often do that with a certain self-deprecating humor <laughs> where you will, uh, you know, you're, you understand the seriousness of the issues, of course, but you also are able to, uh, you know, not think too highly of yourself that you, you can, uh, you know, you can acknowledge your, your shortcomings in a way that, uh, you know, speaks to a humility that uh, I think many of us uh, would admire. Uh, so with that, I thought I'd start off by just uh, asking you, Mark, your thoughts, you know, what motivated you to write this book? You know, I think the, the same thing that motivated you to speak out as you so consistently have, Charlie. Um, just a, a, a frustration with what has come of the party, what's come of politics of late, um, the way in which there has um, evolved, if you will, a, a, a rapid departure from certain tenets that I thought were core to conservatism to the Republican Party, uh, all of which I think is important in terms of the national debate and how we solve problems in this country. So it was sort of a chance to speak out one last time. I mean, I've hung up the spurs on politics, but it doesn't mean that you still don't care. It doesn't mean you still don't want a voice in this larger debate that needs to take place that hadn't been taking place in this country. And, you know, you and I, I guess, were a bit different than most of our colleagues. We spoke up quite a bit. We saw when when the former president would make statements that were, you know, completely out of bounds or <laughs> or or, uh, you know, uh, way you know far beyond irreverent but offensive. We would uh, you know, we would we would basically state that we disagreed. And and here's why. And, and I and I guess the other question I have, why do you think more of our colleagues, our former colleagues, 
um, who knew better and are good people, uh, just chose either to be silent or to go along. And, this, and to bring it back to your, you know, uh, two roads traveled, you know, it's, it's oftentimes just easier to go down the, uh, you know, the one, the, the path most traveled. Uh, and uh, and uh, why do you think they, they, they took, you know, the, the easy route? Well, I mean, as you, well, I think there are three reasons. One is, as we both know, for a lot of folks, the name of the game is staying into the game, period. Uh, it's not about ideas and ideals. They're good people, but they're fairly elastic on, on some of the, the, the things that they believe relative to the core mission, which is staying in the game. So I think that that's part of it. I, I think another part of it is you, we, we both remember that saying in Washington, which was it's the pioneers that end up with the arrows in the back. And so, you know, when an issue's hot, it's, I mean, you can't push a politician away from the microphone or the, the television camera. But until it is, uh, people on both sides of the aisle are surprisingly conservative in their approach to new or different issues or ones that they aren't quite sure about. Uh, and then finally, I would say a, a lot of it's just raw pragmatism. Um, you know, if you talk to Lindsey uh, Graham, who, you know, I, I began with in politics back here in South Carolina, he would say, hey, it's the cost of admission. And um, and therefore, I, you know, I, I, I got to say what I got to say, but it keeps me in the game. And therefore, I'm willing to pay the cost of admission. So I think it's a combination of those three things. Um, but the bottom line is it's disappointing because. An equally important old saying is, you know, the only way that evil prevails in this world is when good people don't speak up. Yeah. And it, so I admire so much the way you spoke up so consistently from the very beginning. I wish that more of our colleagues had. You know, I, I just, you know, I, I often think now that I've been out a while that, you know, politics has become not just tribal, but situational. Mm -hmm. You know, if my if my guy does it, it's fine. If your guys does it, it it's a human rights violation. And then, you know, and then and you go a few years forward and the shoe's on the other foot. And, you know, <laughs> no, I mean, I would take, for instance, just in this last week and Nikki Haley, who, again, followed me in the governorship in South Carolina, uh, you know, has spoken up loud and clear about how outrageous she thinks it would be if the Biden administration negotiated with the Taliban. OK, that's a viewpoint. The problem is, as we both know, just a couple months ago, she was saying the opposite as she praised Pompeo and their team and saying it's all going according to plan as the Trump administration approached negotiating with the Taliban. And so you're completely right. It has gone to the point of insanity on how tribal it is, which is one day it's a good idea, oh, different tribe. No, now it's a bad idea. And that is lethal in an open political system because our founding fathers gave us, as we both know, a reason-based republic. And if we lose that, I mean, we lose one of the major stools that holds our system up and in place if it's all tribal and just because the guy at the top or the gal at the top says it's so, well, it must be so. That's not the way our system's supposed to work. I think you and I both came from the school where, you know, we thought it was important to be fairly consistent. Now I get it. Politics. Sometimes we have to adjust. Yeah. Uh, circumstances change. And, you know, we sometimes have to diverge from where we ordinarily might be on a given policy issue. And, and that's to be expected in politics, you know, the, the, with the compromises and all the, the concessions and things that you have to do to, you know, to, to get to an agreement. Sometimes, it, you know, you, you have to bend a little, sure. but, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm just amazed how some, you know, could be so inconsistent uh, and and could just uh, like I, I'll, I'll take an example, an issue like uh, trade, where I thought a core tenant of the Republican Party was that, you know, we believed in opening markets and, you know, freer trade was better. We want yeah. fair trade, but we, we yeah. think markets should be open for America's producers and, and growers and and manufacturers, et cetera. And, you know, when the president came out and, and uh, you know, it was going to impose tariffs on steel and aluminum from places like Canada and Mexico yeah. and Brazil and European cars. Uh, I mean, I, I just thought, well, this was a, a core principle that was being violated. And so many just said nothing or, 
you know, and there was a little action. I mean, these are the kinds of things that I guess troubled me that I thought, wow. I mean, I was always kind of called a rhino because and you're, you're more, a lot more conservative than I am. I was more, more moderate. And, and I always kind of got a kick out of that, that, you know, all these people who I always called the rhino hunters, the people who I would refer to as the self-designated chiefs of the Republican purity police, right, 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 you know, just became their, their, their litmus test became loyalty to the president rather than to any particular set of values or ideals. Or policy no and, 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 and what's particularly crazy about that, as you, as you well know, the measure that was used in imposing the quotas on Canada was a national security measure. And so the way in which people can, with a straight face, say, you know, uh, well, OK, the president's really twisting the law beyond belief. How in the world one of our longest term allies could be now a national security threat, uh, Canada, uh, is beyond belief, but well, okay, we'll just keep a straight face and we'll not only be against this court in a trade, but we will look the other way as the president uses a national security measure against Canada, again, a longtime ally. But anyway. Yeah, yeah, well, I know. Well, it's, it's funny you say that because, you know, I, I was, you know, in charge of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Military Construction and the VA and related agencies, which included the American Battle Monuments Commission. And so I've been to Normandy and I've you know, I took time not only to visit the American graveside, but the British and the Canadian uh, cemeteries. Right. And, you know, I keep saying, you know, they died alongside us at the beaches of Normandy. And now they're a national security threat. And by the way, they're fighting with us in Afghanistan. And they're right. you know, been the, our dearest uh, friends and partners and allies, uh, you know, since almost the beginning of the Republic. We have <laughs> the is there with the British early on, but, but, yeah. the, uh, but they have been true friends. And I, I just thought that was such a it's such an egregious thing to do to a, a friend. And by the way, we exported more steel to Canada than they did to us. And so I, right, never, quite, right. I never quite figured it out. But yeah. so that's a, an example. But hey, I want to get back to the book here for a second. And one thing that I thought was really interesting in your book, uh, in the um, in your in your parting thoughts in that section and in and, and the epilogue or epistles, as you referred to them as, you know, you, you have one there and I want to just bring it up. I'm just going to. Read to it. You know, it was it was a a, a letter or a, a memo to uh, Congressman Jim Jordan, and in it you write, um, you know, indeed over the last six years that I was in Congress, I thought I got to know people like you and Meadows and Mulvaney, but after the way I, ideals were abandoned over the last few years, so that the group could the group being the Freedom Caucus could stay relevant, and you or Mark could make mention of regular calls from the president, I feel I didn't know you at all. I mean, that's what you said. And I just I just thought, you know, you might comment on maybe some of these epistles and some of these you, you sent one I, I through to, to other other uh, leading uh, Republicans. And I just thought it was really interesting. That's the way you organize. You, you did you did epistles to evangelical Christians, uh, to Trump voters, to Democrats, um, you know, to, I said to Matt, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, Matt Gates, Taylor Green, Pelosi. So why don't you talk a little bit about those epistles? I, I, you know, I. I just think important. it's important in life just to call it like you see it. Um, nobody has a perfect view of truth, but there is a thing called truth out there. And it has become so elastic in the world of politics of late that it's incredibly disturbing. And I think offsetting for a lot of regular folks out there who are going about their lives and hoping that the political process is indeed watching out for them. And so you, you take the example of Jim Jordan. I mean, I mean, this is a group who, you know, the Freedom Caucus, of which I was a part, uh, you know, initially was a, very much opposed to Trump. But then they completely, with the exception of Justin Amash, who's now left Congress as well, uh, completely flipped and became absolutely subservient to him. And that's not a little bit of a rotation on an issue based on new information or based on, you know, input from voters. It is just raw, crass uh, uh, um, pandering. And uh, I, I thought it was particularly disturbing with people like Meadows or Jordan or, 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 or Mulvaney from my home state. I, I remember Mulvaney uh, talking about, look, if it takes shutting down the government, then that's what we got to do because this national debt is of such importance. It's a, it's a systemic threat to our civilization. 
we got to do whatever we can do to, to, to throw a, a monkey wrench in the equation. Okay. That, again, that's a viewpoint. Well, he the shut it down. Was, <laughs> he shut it down. He was yeah, in there. Yeah. But, but the problem was only a matter of months later, he becomes OMB director under the Trump administration and completely reverses his opinion. I got into it with him at a budget committee hearing where I somehow made national news when I said the obvious, which I said, this budget is a lie because the numbers in no way added up. And yet here's a guy who was saying one thing about the importance of the debt a few months earlier and then completely abandons that ideal a matter of months later. And I just think that's incredibly disturbing. And it's part of what turns people off to politics. It's particularly part of what's turning young people off to the Republican Party of late based on their saying, look, I don't always love mom or dad, but whatever's going on in Washington, they're so inconsistent with what they've been trying to teach me. I'm out. And I, I think the conservative movement is, whether it's with suburban and working moms or young people, losing vital chunks to its, its, its team, if you will, based on people like Jordan or, or Mulvaney or others saying one thing one moment and doing something completely opposite the next. South Carolina's economy is growing, bringing new businesses and opportunities. The need for electricity is growing too. At Duke Energy, we're meeting the challenge, providing even more electricity that's reliable, that stays affordable. To do this, we're investing in our communities with a diverse, balanced mix of energy sources and making targeted upgrades to the grid so that South Carolina can thrive in a smarter energy future. Paid for by Duke Energy shareholders. The most exciting part of a vacation stay at a home rental? Easy. It's being greeted upon arrival with a rusted lockbox affixed to the underside of a stranger's condo. Yeah, you simply twist knobs, click gears, jiggle it, and then rip it off its moorings, and voila! Your prize is a key to a questionable home rental and maybe tetanus. When you just want to get your vacation started by actually getting into your room, it matters where you stay. At Hilton, we deliver your key right to your phone on the Hilton Honors app. Hilton for the stay. Well, we're back to the situational nature of politics again. You know, where one stands uh, depends on where one sits. So when he when he had that seat on the budget committee, he's you know, he had one set of policy uh, positions. And then when he became OMB director, uh, quite a different set of uh, uh, positions. And I that's then that's really what's so, uh, I think, disturbing to so many people out there. And, you know, and I and you may disagree with this, but I'd be curious to get your thoughts. when you look at what happens in, uh, uh, in, 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 in Congress today, you know, I've often felt that the center right to the center left of the American political spectrum is not well represented, or I should say is underrepresented Completely in true. the U.S. Congress. And more in the House than the Senate, but certainly in the House. Uh, and and I, I think that's, you know, I know you are more to the right on that political spectrum but I've noticed that because even a person like you, who was nobody would have ever called a liberal or a squish or a rhino or, 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 you know, or a moderate or a centrist, nobody would ever called you that. You know, you're very, you know, very strong, principled conservative. And now because you've spoken against uh, the former president, there are people who now think you're a moderate. Completely. And, yeah, I mean, I just, you know, my head's ready to explode when I hear some of these things. No, no. I mean, but, but, you know, to your point. I mean, I'm a guy who carried two live squealing pigs into the state house when I was governor, decrying pork over some constitutional mandates in our state. I mean, I've been about as far out there on the nut job category as you can get, Charlie. I mean, I've been way out there. And yet in the age of Trump, I was viewed as a squish rhino establishment. I mean, there's not one road or bridge named after me in South Carolina. I've I've consistently fought the establishment, but I was, quote, a squish, part of the establishment. And here's a telling thing. You know, after my loss, the next night, I had a pre-organized dome tour in the Capitol. And um, and so I was there with some folks from home and giving the, the dome tour around the corner. And who should be there but Jeff Flake and his wife giving a dome tour as well. And so, uh, you know, uh, I don't think you've ever lost an election. But, you know, if you have, they treat you like you have now rigor mortis or you have a terminal illness or somebody up close in the family died. And. 
everybody that day was really solicitous. Like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And so Jeff and his wife grabbed me, pulled me aside. I'm so sorry, whatever. And we got into a conversation and they're like, you know, we really wanted to have another term in the Senate, but we saw the handwriting on the wall, you know, based on what happened to you and others. And, and we didn't want that. And so we're getting out, but, 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 it, uh, uh, tell me more about the election. I said, it was a really weird one because in, you know, people would come up and say, are you for or against Trump? And I'd say, well, I, I'm neither for nor against him. I'm for these different ideas. And they kept pivoting back to one question, which was, are you for or against Trump? And Jeff says, uh, he goes, that's so weird because thousands of miles away out in Arizona, that was the one question people asked me. Are you for or against Trump? And it became the litmus test for are you establishment? Or are you part of the system? Or are you not part of the system? And that's a crazy reference point when you begin to look to one person as your litmus test in, again, the system that our founding fathers gave us, which is all about not basing things on one person. I'm glad you brought up Jeff and Cheryl Flake, who are very good friends of mine. Jeff was my paddleball partner for years yeah. in Congress. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and, and but he's, I mean, I was going to br- bring him up anyway before you mentioned him because he's another one who nobody would have ever called a moderate or a centrist. And he was always, when he was, in, I, we, look, we served with him in the House. And yeah. this is a man who would go to the House floor and challenge every single earmarked and appropriations bill. And he would get beaten like a redded mule. Right. And he, yeah. But he was a happy warrior. You know, he was yeah. a happy warrior. And if you, even people who disagree with Jeff Flake liked him because yeah. they like him because he's a very, you know, he's, 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 not, he's got a very good spirit about him. You know, he has strong principles and he doesn't bend on them, uh, but he's not mean or nasty. I mean, he's very... Uh, he tries to be <clears throat> fair and above board. And, and but the same thing with him. You know, he was also, you know, called a, a, a centrist or a moderate or a squish or a rhino or all these uh, terms. I didn't want to call you. Call, what did you call yourself? Did you say wacko? Or did you yeah, say, no job, whatever. You know, you go <laughs> in. I was being polite. I was being polite. But I just said you were kind of on the right wing of the, the spectrum. Uh, but, uh, but, 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 but here's the important part, which is to, to, to the credit of where you and others stood. Though I was extreme right, that was simply a bargaining tool for where I, I, I wanted the, the overall system to get a little bit more right. But you always compromise to the middle because that's the nature of our system. And what, to your point, has gone out the window of late with extreme right, extreme left, is we've hollowed out the center of the American political base. And we do so at great, great danger because the center has been, again, what the glue that's held our system together. We've got, you know, 300 plus million people, a lot of different viewpoints. And that ability to say, I'm, I'm over here and you're over here, but at the end of the day, okay, we can get this and let's strike a deal and let's keep moving. You lose that, again, our system doesn't work. And you indeed look to a king or a queen or a dictator to come up with a solution because you won't find it if you can't negotiate to the center in our system. Yeah, you know, and, and interestingly enough, you also in your book you write epistles to Nancy Pelosi and <clears throat> Joe Biden and Democrats, and you know, I my observation has been that that the, that the leadership in both parties in the House, and I won't comment so much in the Senate, but on the House, that they tend to be much more captive to the harder elements of the base within the within their caucuses or conferences. Sure. That is that the that they will that that's that's where they're safe. <laughs> as leaders. So that's because that's where the numbers are. So you, you take some of the agreements like this, uh, this bipartisan infrastructure bill, for example, where, you know, this, this deal wasn't hashed out by leaders, by the leaders. It was hashed out by the more pragmatic, I'll say more centrist members sure. in the Senate and, and to a certain extent in the House who were also uh, participating in the Problem Solvers Caucus. And so I look at that and I say, well, you know, the leaders are the, are the ones who should be really trying to help put those compromises together. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they're really capable of doing it. You know, you take, you know, Chuck Schumer, you know, he's got to watch his left flank right now. The AOC may primary him. Right. You know, yeah, Kevin McCarthy wants to be speaker and he, you know, he's worried about, you know, elements, uh, you know, the market, the Freedom Caucus elements uh, and others, you know, who will, you know, try to take him down uh, again, you know, like they did in 2015 uh, when he tried to elevate the speaker. So there, there, so there's no, there, there's no real incentive for them to, it seems at times, you know, to try to seek that 
consensus or that compromise or it's dangerous for them. I think they might, might want to do it, but there's real danger in doing it. And so if you leave it to these gangs or groups in the right. Senate or the House, well, that kind of gives you a little bit of cover of your leader. But the whole point is, I thought that was the leader's job. Once upon a time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Well, why don't you talk about some of those epistles uh, to the Democrats? Because you know, I'm I'm surprised too. For example, with the Biden uh, agenda, I, I I am very surprised, frankly, uh, that I thought his mandate was one to you know to to bring back some measure of normal normality and stability to the functioning of the White House and government more generally, address the the COVID crisis, uh, you know, more thoughtfully than his predecessor did, uh, and to really you know just kind of right the ship of state. And it was really more of a call for incrementalism. Than it was for radical or not radical, but or you know extreme transformation mm-hmm. or you know more revolutionary change. And I think that this mandate has been misread uh, by many on the Democratic side by going as big as they have, particularly on the on the spending side. Uh, and I'm I'm a little bit surprised by it all that uh, that um, there hasn't been uh, more pushback. Although I think there's more now, but I'm just curious what your thoughts were and what your message was uh, to, to the Democrats. I, I agree with you, and I, I, that is indeed a part of the different epistles that I, I, I wrote, whether to Nancy or whether to the president. Um, and, th- and that is, if you look, take the case of Biden, not illogically, people surmised based on his long tenure in the Senate, and it's, it's, it's institutional push toward moderation that he would be moderate and he'd govern as a moderate and people were thirsty for that. They're like, we're tired of the crazy. We've had the bombast. <clears throat> let's, let's just try, as you put it, incrementalism, little steps <clears throat> before we start running wild in either direction. And he, to your point, hasn't governed as much that way as people I think thought he would, at least down here in South Carolina. And I think that's to his detriment. Um, I think that there's a real thirst for, moderate, sensible, efficient, and effective governance out of the White House. Um, Particularly after Trump, people were really, really thirsty for that. But on on your point, the spending has gone nuts. I mean, it actually went nuts under Trump's watch, uh, to be fair. And you saw about another, you know, $8 trillion of debt added to the national debt. And you've seen that, 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 financial recklessness continue under the Biden administration. And I think that these chickens will soon come home to roost. I mean, I think that there are two things that will kill, threaten to kill off a a civilization. One is too much in the way of spending. And I think Reinhardt and Rogoff wrote an interesting book entitled This Time It's Different. Some of their methodology was questioned, but the larger premise was completely accurate. And that is they looked at the last 800 years of financial history as it relates to governments and they found overwhelmingly that at, 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 at juncture points, uh, we're in basically a civilization had to decide, do we go back to some of what maybe is competitive and perhaps a world power uh, in the first place, or do we stay on this happy but ultimately unsustainable cycle of upward government spending and consumption? Nine times out of 10, policymakers said, well, this time it's different. And of course, it never was. Gravity always works. Math always works. And it was the seeds of that civilization's undoing. So I think we have a major threat financially that requires prudence and moderation that we're not seeing right now. And again, part of that was the buildup we saw under Trump and, and frankly, other Republican presidents that have preceded. Uh, but a big part of it right now is on the Democratic side, and you don't want that shoe to drop while you're in office. And I fear that it may. So that's one threat. And the other threat is what we've been talking about, which is raw tribalism in a democratic system that's not designed for tribalism. And again, either one of those threats can really kill, kill off the blessing that we've seen in the American experiment. And, and, and it's particularly important when you think about the way in which the last president threatened a lot of the institutional mores and traditions that have been the glue that held our system together. I mean, the founding father set up, you know, division of power laterally and vertically, but the real glue has been the peaceful transition of power. It has been the idea that there's truth, math and science, they really do exist. I mean, you just go down the list of little things, 
you know, the, the, the notion that we have a, not a rigged electoral system, but a real electoral system, all of those little things contribute to people's trust in the system. You lose trust in the system. Again, in an open political system, you lose it all. So that's a long winded way of saying, I think a little bit of moderation would go a long way right now. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. And, and I'll tell you, before we continue on this conversation on the policy side, I wanted to get back to the book. You know, you talk quite a bit about your own personal journey mm-hmm. and, you know, the, the, the challenges you've had in your life, the successes. And uh, let's talk about something I know it's probably a little di- more difficult to talk about. You know, you talk about, you know, your, your, your marriage obviously ended in divorce with, yeah. you know, with what had happened when you were governor. And can you talk a little bit about that? Because I've heard you co- oftentimes, you know, talk about you know, in a very self-deprecating way, you know, your own personal shortcomings and how that has, you know, made you a, a better and more thoughtful and reflective person. Uh, why don't you just tell us about that? Yeah, I address it in the book because... I, I hate the way in which politicians these days aren't real. And I think that some measure of authenticity is important if you're trying to make a case. The case I'm trying to make is we're at a major inflection point in our country. We have real threats, whether it's on the financial side, whether it's the tribalism we were just talking about, a number of other things. And we better, we better, we better turn the curve here or we got really bad stuff coming our way. And I think to make that case, you need some measure of credibility and, and, you know, part of it I'd have is, you know, six terms in the house and two terms as governor and a variety of other things. But part of it rests in who am I as a person to, to speak about this. And part of the reason I've spoken up as I did when Trump came along about truth and its significance is my own deficiency on that front in 2009. I, I told what was, I thought a little white lie that was intended for one person. Turns out it became a national headline and national joke. This idea, you know, if anybody asks, I'll be happy out hiking on the Appalachian Trail. That was never intended for the media. It was never intended to be disseminated. It was intended for one person, my former wife. We were under a trial separation at that point. And, and it, it, it led to a rather searing personal experience in the last year and a half in the governorship and some rather intense conversations with my boys and, supporters and friends and family. And it leads you to this point where you say, A, I've learned a lesson that is its own unique journey on the significance of, quote, a little white lie and its damage and the importance, therefore, of truth. And so when things came along, I give you an example, in, uh, in the Trump administration, I was left with no other choice than to, to speak out. I wasn't being a hero. I wasn't being as brave as you were. It just, I had a really searing personal experience that locked into me sort of where I had to be, particularly as it relates to uh, the audience I care about most, which is an audience of four, my four sons. And, and again, the, the gravity and the sensitivity of the conversations we'd have over the years. And so here's a little example. Back, back when I was in Congress this last go round, Microphone come. Uh, I mean, a reporter comes up, sticks a microphone in my face, and says, "You know, do you think whoever the next nominee is should release their tax returns?" And I say, "Yeah, uh, a it's a fifty year tradition that's held with Republicans and Democrats alike, um, but really, in some ways, it has little to do with presidential returns and everything to do with down ballot returns." At that point, I was either one of one or one of two. I, I can't remember if Charlie Crist was back then, but either. You know, the only former governor who was in the House or, again, one of two. So it was not illogical that the reporter was coming to ask me this question. And so I say it has everything to do with why you're asking the question, which is I did release my tax returns twice when I got the nomination both times for the gubernatorial run in South Carolina. And believe me, if you quit doing it at the presidential level, folks at the gubernatorial level will stop doing it. I think that that added piece of transparency has value. Therefore, it ought to continue. Fast forward, Trump gets the nomination. Same reporter comes back, sticks a microphone in your face. And you're left with a sort of pretty easy question. You know the politics, which is not to give the same answer you gave before. Uh, You're not dumb. But you also know the conversations you had with your four sons on truth and what it means and 
this rather searing personal journey you went on. And so you give the exact same answer. Well, what's that lead to? It leads to being there on the floor of the house, there in the well, and the speaker comes up to me, Speaker Ryan. He's like, what's the deal? I'm like, what do you mean, what's the deal? He goes, why are you gunning for Trump? I said, I'm not gunning for Trump. What are you talking about? He goes, I was just down at the, the White House. I was in the Oval Office. The guy has 535 knuckleheads to worry about up here on Capitol Hill. And he's bringing one name up. He's bringing yours. You're gunning for him on the tax return thing. I said, no, no, I'm not gunning for him on the tax return thing. I'm just trying to be consistent with the answer I gave last time. So that's, again, a long-winded way of saying, I think we all have personal journeys. I think it's important to acknowledge where you've come up short. I include that in the book because I think it's a way of being transparent about the fact that I have come up short in life. But more importantly, I've learned some lessons in that journey that I think have everything to do with why I've spoken up against Trump or why I speak out on different things that I do now. Well, that's so singular and that, you know, it's, it's obviously very difficult and courageous to do so because most elected officials, most politicians are, are really much better at talking about all the things they think they're doing right and all the good things they're doing and, and uh, tend to try not to ever talk about the things they may have uh, done wrong or made mistakes on. And so uh, to your credit, you know, that's, a, that's really out of the box, so to speak, from, a, from, a, from the perspective of an elected official. And I, I do get a kick out of what you just said, too, uh, that, uh, uh, that you, know, you gave the same answer twice. Right, right. In other words, you know, because the situation changed, why should your response have changed? Okay, you, you made that statement when you were uh, governor and and before Trump. I made it when I was first in Congress, before yeah. Trump got the nomination, and then he got the nomination. The same reporter came back and asked the question again. And so, anyway, well, you know. I think that was part part of the challenge that we all faced. Um, that you know, reporters would shove microphones in our faces. And I remember one in particular, I was uh, walking between the Capitol Hill Club and uh, the, the Cannon office building a reporter, you know, put a microphone in my face and said, what do you think of uh, Donald Trump's comments about, I think it was Miss Venezuela, where he said she was too heavy, you know, right. made some disparaging comments about her over this, uh, uh, this uh, beauty contest, right. this whatever he had, this Miss Universe or Miss World, yeah. whatever it was, yeah. I don't, I didn't pay that close attention to it. Right. But, but I just well, look, obviously it's it's inappropriate. You know, he's he's either I, I forget if he was a candidate for president at the time. Yeah. And I said, so, you know, really, if you're running for president of the United States, you really should be talking about much more important matters yeah. uh, that um, that are really relevant to what you're doing. And those types of ad hominem attacks on this woman are really, you know, kind of out of bounds and unfair. You know, and it's right. I mean, that's what, and then people say, why are you attacking the president? And I, you know, I was of the, the opinion if somebody says something outrageous. Right. And I'll, and I'll pick on Steve King. He makes a racially incendiary comment. Right. Uh, and then, you know, then you're asked about it and you condemn the comment. And then then I'm not saying he, but maybe right. somebody will come back to you and say, well, why did you badmouth? Him? And I well, I said, well, doesn't he owe us the apology? It's not the other way around. You know, it's right, not. Right. About me, it's about him. You know, <laughs> it's about him. And that's what always struck me is uh, it was so different that. You know, they were they were yelling at the firefighters rather than the arsonists. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> I mean, that was I mean, I just will never in my lifetime understand it that. Um, and, and I have to explain that to some of my constituents who said, well, why do you say these things? I said, well, because I get asked questions publicly and they said, well, why don't you just avoid the questions? I said, you elected me to lead, not right, to hide. Right. Not to hide. I mean, right. some of my, some sometimes supporters would say, why don't you? just kind of take a low profile or just, I said, I'd rather not have to answer those questions. <laughs> I really wouldn't like to answer them, but I think I look foolish if I avoid the question altogether and pretend I didn't hear it. But that's <laughs> what I love about you, Charlie. I mean, I mean, that's what we need more of in politics and the degree to which people will either completely twist themselves in a knot avoiding the question or the degree which they'll, uh, you know, change the subject and you know, answer some other random question or just not answered at all is crazy. And again, leads to people's distrust and cynicism of uh, all actors in the political system. And that's most unfortunate. Yeah. And it really speaks to leadership. I mean, you were a governor and you know how it, you were a congressman and a governor. So you know what it's like. I mean, as a, as a governor, you, you had to, you had to you know, pre- present proposals to the legislature and you had to help direct them. 
And then they would chop on your proposals. They, they, you know, they say what they will, some they like, they dislike, and then they, then you have to hash it out. And right. that's what leadership is, is about. And I, I think we've kind of lost a lot of that in uh, recent years. What, what I, the, my traditional notion of leadership and yours, I think is, you know, has kind of been turned on its, its head in many respects. No, I agree with you. It's funny, Jim Edwards, who was a, a, a governor years ago and uh, has, 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 has passed, but just a great guy. I remember going, when I first got elected governor to each of the other living governors in South Carolina and sitting down with them and just asking their advice. I, I'm like, I've never done this before, but I'd love to get your wisdom on, on uh, I- any lessons learned that you might pass along to somebody who's new to the, to the club. And, and I remember Jim Edwards telling me, he said, you better start making friends now because the nature of leadership is you got to make a call. And with every call you make, you're going to offend somebody. You're going to start losing friends. So start making friends now. And uh, instead, to your point, we've ended up with a bunch of pastry chefs and, you know, they wander around the halls of Congress or their districts. And, hey, if you don't like this dessert, try this one or try this one or try this one. And they're endlessly just trying to please, which is a long way from, you know, someone like Abraham Lincoln, who made some incredibly tough calls. But he he called it and, you know, offended some people in the process. But that is the nature of leadership. You actually got to make a call one flavor or the other. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, what I found, too, is that I found that our constituents, you know, could take the truth. Mm-hmm. In other words, they, they, they were not going to the high, but in, 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 I would have town hall meetings, and I'm sure you did, too, and we would have conversations, and somebody might say something outrageous, and I would try to politely, you know, just rebut them, right. you know, very politely, very nicely, you know, <laughs> without, without judgment. And, you know, I, and I felt that that was important rather than letting people get away with saying things that were, you know, completely false or, right. you know, now, uh, offensive, but at least try to nicely just bring it back to a, a better place. Uh, and I think we've kind of gotten away from all that. Uh, yeah, in, that, that makes you and Malcolm Goodwell's or whatever, Malcolm whoever it was, uh, an outlier. <laughs> that is not the way it's done here lately. Yeah, I, I, I guess. But, but like, but I even during. You know, we, we well, during the, the first government shutdown of 2013, um, you know, I kind of became somewhat famous, at least momentarily, for stating the obvious that and I was pretty outspoken at that time, saying that this was really a, a fool's errand, that there was no this was this has no chance of success, right. whether we like Obamacare or not. Um, you know, defunding Obamacare in a, in, a, in a, you know, about a 70 day discretionary appropriations bill would, couldn't work even if you signed it in the law. But this right. is really dumb. Uh, and that um, and we should just you know fund the government for 70 days as we normally do. And and uh, thinking that, oh, maybe I just ended my political career. What I found out at home, I, you know, I, I not that I was I wasn't doing polling, but other groups were. And my poll numbers went up whenever you ever most Republicans numbers were going down. And I didn't even think I thought I was committing political suicide. But I learned a lesson there that that, you know, people will respond well to the truth. And I would have people come up to me in the grocery store at that time and say, Hey, I like you because you're not nuts. Right. I mean, that was, that was high praise. <laughs> that was a high pretty praise. low bar. <laughs> I know it's a low bar and high praise. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so look, uh, so let's get back to, uh, uh, let's get back to the book again and, and talk about, um, you, you know, your, you know, what was the most meaningful experience to you, in the house uh, during your time there, you know, what, what, what was you, what, what do you feel was your, your greatest and most proudest accomplishment uh, during either? Tour know. Either? You know, I, I was more, um, you know, in the governorship, you can uh, in much more concrete form uh, accomplish and do. Uh, so I'd say probably greatest accomplishments would go on the gubernatorial side rather than congressional side on the congressional side. Uh, I remember the late Tom Coburn, uh, God rest his soul, just a great guy, uh, 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 a stridently uh, consistent conservative. Uh, Whether you liked him or not, the guy was consistent and knew what he was about and drew certain lines in the sand. I remember going down with him. We were back in the house. This was back in the the mid-'90s. and we offered like a hundred <laughs> amendments to an appropriations bill because the the Congress, uh, Gingrich and, and company had sort of reversed themselves on 
I think I can't remember the issue now. It's been so long ago. I, I think it was as part of the contract with America when we came in, promised to cut committee and funding s- staffing by like a quarter or something. Again, I'm not sure of the numbers. It's been this back in 1994. Been so long. Uh, and 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 then what happened was they quietly came back around and reinserted half the funding. And we're like, no, we, we ran on the contract with America. We said this was our deal. And we can come back and save the American public, going back to your point of the voter can handle the truth. They like to hear the truth and say, look, we're new at this. We haven't done it in 40 years. We kind of overshot on our cut committee and staff and funding. And so we're going to add back half of that. That would be OK. But don't do the Washington thing where you quietly add into a line item that nobody sees uh, the committee staffing and funding and, and, and not fess up to, to overshooting in that cut. And so as an objection, we, we had offered all these amendments to an appropriations bill, like a hundred. And we were trying to basically pull a filibuster in the house, which you can't pull, but we were attempting our best shot at it. And it was goofy things like that, all designed to say we ought to be what we're about. And, and, I, 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 again, I particularly praise somebody like Tom Coburn for his consistency on that front. Yeah, he, yeah, may he rest in peace. Yeah, he, he was very certainly uh, strongly principled, and uh, and I'm sure he drove the leadership crazy. And, uh, and yeah, yeah. Tom, he, he was he was seldom wrong and never in doubt. But uh, no doubt about it. Uh, but uh, but speaking of the filibuster, uh, I, I noticed in your book you made some references there um, at various points. Uh, I forgot exactly where, but in, in the book, uh, I, I'd i be curious your thoughts. And we were both house guys. Now, I'll give you my perspective and you tell me yours. Sure. I thought the I thought the Senate filibuster was the last remaining mechanism in Washington to compel some level of bipartisan cooperation. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. it's abused. Yes, it's overused. I mean, I can there are deficiencies with it, but without it. Um, the the Senate would look a lot more like the House. And I, I was a guy who was a more moderate, more centrist kind of guy, more center right. I always I always liked the fact that the Senate could end up <coughs> a bill that I know would be able to become law. Mm-hmm. And it gave me comfort because the House, you know, whether it's Republican control or Democratic control, will send over a more hard edged bill on the hard right or the hard left sending it over to the Senate. You know, they beat their chest. say, yeah, boy, we're pandering to the base knowing that the bill that bill that they sent over will not become law. And then it would always take the cooler heads of the Senate to come up with a, a compromise to get to a bipartisan 60 vote threshold. They would send it back. And just like on this bipartisan infrastructure bill, I've always said, you know, the uh, whenever the Senate passes a bill in a strong bipartisan ma- manner on a major piece of legislation, the House will eat it every single time, <laughs> every single time. And so if you get rid of the filibuster or you uh, change it and dramatically weaken it, I do worry. Now, I, I hear the arguments about Jim Crow. And I've always said, well, OK, you know, uh, fair enough. But last I checked, the 1964 uh, Civil Rights Act and the 1965 Voting Rights Act became law in spite of the filibuster. And it did because there was a national consensus at the time to do something. And that's how they did it. It wasn't about the rules. It's about the right. people. No, I mean, I, I would agree with you, Charlie. I mean, I, I think, again, the absolute genius uh, that took place there in your home state in what the founding fathers crafted is just unbelievable. And so they gave disproportionate voice to the majority in the House and the saying, as we both remember, was, you know, the minority in the House is there to collect a pension and provide a quorum, and that's about it. I mean, crazy amount of control to the majority on the House side. And then they reversed it over on the Senate side, and it's really the minority that has disproportionate voice on the Senate side. And, and again, the genius of that construct is so remarkable. And so I would cede the point that some of the appendages to the notion of filibuster should probably be trimmed. But the larger construct of the filibuster, I completely agree with you, should remain in place because that, again, constant push toward moderation, the way in which the founding fathers 
not only divided, you know, again, power laterally, but vertically as well with, through the notion of federalism is raw genius. And it's all about preventing that which we saw over the last couple of years. Trump would have made a great dictator. Problem is, that's not the American system. And I don't want a dictator. And I don't want to live under a dictator. And I don't want my boys to live under a dictator. And, and we better watch out, though, because... You know, um, you know, Hayek's book, uh, The Road to Serfdom, is a telling tale on what can go wrong in an open political system if we get the wrong ingredients in place. Yeah. And, 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 and so his tale is of post-World War I Germany and the descent into uh, the Germans accepting Hitler. And so I'm, I'm not saying, you know, Trump was Hitler. I'm not saying that. But 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 the, the the forces at play, we need to watch out and, and guard against going back to this notion of filibuster, going back to the genius of the founding fathers and their construct of the system, because what they talk about is how uh, yeah, under financial duress, when people are carrying around a wheelbarrow, a load of currency to buy so much as a loaf of bread, political philosophy goes out the window and it's raw survival at that point. A strong man comes along, as I described it said, look, I'll solve these problems for you. you got to give up a few freedoms in the process, but I'll solve the problems for you. And again, it chronicles Hitler's rise to power. We better watch out in the United States of America because, you know, if you look at Germany at that time, incredibly educated, church-going uh, populace. I mean, it, it was a remarkable civilization, and yet it went crazy route based on, on economic duress and people's desire to seek a, a, a way out and, Everybody hopes for a Santa Claus or somebody to solve their problems. We better watch out for people coming along offering solutions to all the problems, which is what we saw over the last four years. Because if we combine a, a downturn in the economy, which is long overdue, our degree of debt and, and the tribalism that's now in play, you have a lethal formula there for bad things happening. Or conversely, if we experience you know, real inflation. And then of course, interest rates pop up, yeah. uh, respond to that, uh, uh yeah. that, that threat. Uh, then of course, then the debt becomes even more real because the debt service payments go way up. But you mentioned, right. referenced, uh, the founding fathers. <laughs> I, I always like to point out that Benjamin Franklin, Ben Franklin was my favorite founding father and, uh, helped create one of the great compromises that, that gave us this great nation, which was, uh, you know, the U S Senate, as yeah. my history is correct, I'm speaking from memory here and we're doing this kind of live. So, uh, but the, uh, you know, he's the one who came up, I thought, with the idea to have each state represented by two senators mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, giving, e you know, small states equal representation as large states. So Delaware yeah. and Pennsylvania had equal representation, or Rhode Island and Virginia at the yeah. time, which was a large state. So it was a, there was a genius to it. Although I like to point out, too, I don't believe the founding fathers really weighed in on a filibuster, but the, uh, uh, but they did on the. No, uh, but they, they, they weighed in on the distribution of power, right. uh, um, giving disproportionate voice to the Senate, to your point, and to the minority uh, in the Senate in a way that they didn't in the House. And I think the filibuster is a function of that. That's why I said you could trim some of the edges of it, but the larger point, I think, is a, a very valuable one because you do not want a streamlined political system. It's, as, as much agony as we've both been through in watching the sausage-making process, it's a whole lot better than a really efficient uh, voice from one person at the top. And sometimes what we were doing was an insult to sausage, I must say. <laughs> but the, uh, uh, but uh, hey, but I, let's uh, pivot to a very serious subject because you you brought up, you know, uh, Germany in the post World War One. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what happened on January sixth, mm -hmm. and and um, and you know the you know we we I think we all are learning how fragile our republic is, how fragile our democratic institutions are, that we saw an actual threat to the peaceful transfer of power, which was, uh, you know, just set us all back. I mean, I was I was so upset watching those images that day. I was actually on CN I was on CNN actually talking about it. Mm -hmm. I was hard not to be emotional to see what was happening. Uh, and, you know, what, one of the comments at the time that, that struck me most was from the current German foreign minister. I believe his name is Heiko Maas. And Heiko said, uh, the foreign minister said, what happened in the Capitol that day was uh, very eerily similar to the 19, I think it was 1933 attack on, on the uh, Reichstag 
Right. And, and most people don't know that history, but I thought it was really compelling uh, because there was a the Reichstag, which was the uh, the seat of the German parliament at the time in the Weimar Republic. Right. That was the seat of it. And it was it was burned. It was burned down. And and Hitler and the Nazis blamed some Dutch communist, which right, right, really right. wasn't that, that that was their that was their line at the time. They at least tried to they at least tried to conceal what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. They, they were um, but they were but they were certainly guilty. They had you know, blood on their hands. Uh, and it was a real it, but to hear a, a German foreign minister in 2021 say what he saw at the U.S. Capitol re, reminded him of that analogy with the Reichstag. I mean, we don't like to like like we're very careful about making those types of analogies, but it came from them. Uh, yeah. And and I just thought, wow, I this is a a much more serious moment than I think any of us realize. And, and it's part of what compelled me to write the book. I mean, we are at a pivot point that we have never seen in the 200 plus years of our republic. We've never before had a challenge to the peaceful transition of power in our country before. Um, and, and that ought to be a wake up call for all of us. I mean, we've never had the election question as it's questioned by literally millions of people today across this country in a way that it is now. Th- th- those, I mean, go back to the heart of this notion of being a nation of institutions and traditions that hold the glue together of the system or in the system that the founding fathers created. And so I, I found it disturbing. I, I write about it in the book. I, I was actually up uh, at the Capitol. Our son graduated from Georgetown a number of weeks later, and I went in, and as we both know, there are a couple of different tranches of security as you go into the Capitol. I went in on a Saturday morning, and you could have heard a pin drop. There was no one there, and I sat alone in the rotunda just thinking about the history of the place and my time and investment there and your time and investment there and different friends and colleagues I've known over the years and what was happening? Where were we? Because prior to entering the Capitol, I'd run in, into one of the security guys and I said, well, were you here? And would you tell me about it? And he told me about it. And he took me over to show me two windows that still had plywood up on, on them where they still hadn't gotten the glass right. And it's just, to your point, a, a friend had called me on that day and it was like, I thought he was joking. I, I was like, what? Uh, and I turned it on. It was sort of a, a video of insanity. And you're watching this place where you've spent thousands of hours of your life. And you're like, this can't be. This is surreal. Um, so I, I, I saw it that day. It was bizarre. I saw it when I had my uh, alone day that Saturday morning at the Capitol and a lot of reflection that came with that. And it's, again, part of what compelled me to write the book. We're at a pivot point in this country, and we got to wake up. If not, we got bad things coming our way. Yeah, and in fact, you know, I, I worry, too, about these illiberal, illiberal po- uh, populist movements. You know, whether, you know, you, you think of the Peronist movement, maybe in Argentina or Orban in, uh, in Hungary. Uh, but you see these movements popping up, not just in the United States, but around the world. And, you know, I've often felt that the former president, Donald Trump, was uh, uh, more of a consequence than a cause. In other yeah. words, he, you know, he didn't start the fire, but he's more like an accelerant. You know, right. he's gasoline on the fire. Yeah. Um, and and I I am deeply concerned about the fragility of these institutions because you you know I, I see some in the in the some in the media are are, are trying to hold up uh, Viktor Orban in, in Hungary as some kind of paradigm of, of virtue and what we should aspire to. And I thought, geez, I. You know, my wife's part Hungarian, <laughs> but the, uh, but uh, you know, I never thought of Hungary as the as the the place that uh, you know was the you know was the the forefront of of uh, political or economic or technological advance. I mean, it's not. And and why are we looking at Hungary as the model? Yeah. Uh, and you know, where, where where the press has less freedoms, where the judiciary is also uh, less independent um, because of politicians, but, you know, it's hard to maintain a democracy. You know, anybody can have an election, right? I mean, the old Soviet Union used to have elections. They didn't really right, need right. it, but everybody voted and, you know, only they, they control the list of candidates. But if you don't have a free press, if you don't have an independent judiciary, if you don't have rule of law, 
you know, what what are we? You know, what are we? Uh, and, uh, and, and and these are the erosion points, though. And, you know, when the president of the United States, as President Trump did, goes out and describes the media as the enemy of the state, you are planting the seeds for really bad stuff because any number of folks will latch on to that. And then, you know, if you go into a messy economic time, either with the inflation that you alluded to or some other kind of financial disruption, people get more and more anxious. And, and again, we've been planting seeds, whether it's on, you know, the election's bogus, it's rigged. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. Our system is broken down, not as a federal system, but as a local system that requires a conspiracy to go across thousands of different random precincts across this country to make that possible. But, you know, whether it's planting that seed or again, things like, media being the enemy of state or let's challenge what's happened. I mean, just we're playing with real fire in the way that, to your point, the institutions and traditions of our country are the glue that hold it together. And they've been really under assault over the last couple of years. And it's incumbent upon every one of us, whether me and a little book like this or when uh, friends are talking to friends across the backyard. Yeah, that's the book. Uh, People need to be speaking up. And we need to have a robust conversation about getting back to the center. If not, again, we're in trouble. Well, we're, re- we're approaching that, that final, those final moments of this interview. And I, I did want to give you one shameless plug for this book. Uh, I appreciate it. There it is. Two roads diverged. Uh, yeah. I encourage people to buy it. Uh, it's very interesting uh, from a, a very thoughtful uh, former member of Congress and governor, uh, Mark Sanford. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I hope this conversation has uh, stimulated some thought for for people out there, you know, from just two two former congressmen, you know, who, you know, really love the job, love serving uh, the public. And uh, and, you know, once you have it in your blood, as you know, you really can't get it out of you. You just right. it's kind of like you're an addict, you know, you just can't yeah. get enough of it. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's hard to dry out from politics. But I wanted to say uh you know, thank you, Mark Sanford. Thank you for this thoughtful, this book and this wonderful conversation. Good to see you, my friend. Stay well, stay healthy. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. Be sure to check out our Lectures in History podcast. This week, a lecture on why a new African-American history museum is being built in Charleston, South Carolina. Find it and follow wherever you get your podcasts.